Welcome back to What's Burning. Jack, you good? Good, my bro. What's the word? Man, I can't call it. The weather's nasty over here, but I am good. Let's get right to it. Starting with the week ahead, the Los Angeles Lakers got their first win Sunday night against a tough, young Memphis Grizzly team. Balanced scoring, six guys in double figures. Carmelo with 28 off the bench. We'll touch on what that significance means. And Westbrook with 13 assists. I think my question to you is, with this team being so many new pieces coming together, how long do you feel like it's going to take for this team to get their footing? Uh, I don't think it's going to take long. You know, you got a whole bunch of vets on this team. You got guys that's been dominant and has been, has been all-stars for a long time, all on one team. So the basketball IQ and understanding what they have to do is there. I think they have to collectively grow on defense. They're going to score points easy. They got so many guys that can score and have big nights. I think the biggest thing for them is being a cohesive unit on defense. And I think that's what all of them talking about. And once they focus on that, I think a lot of stuff that people are talking about now will go away. Yeah, I mean, obviously, anytime the Lakers struggle or start off slow, it's gonna the world's going to end. But see, I don't think it's going to come together as fast. I think it's going to definitely come together. But I think with all the new pieces they've added and key guys still out, and guys not playing every single night, I think what they need is just time together. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you can't make up chemistry. Like, you got to find that and build that on the court. Um, so I think it's going to take a little while. I don't think we're going to see the best Laker team or or the team that is going to make a run for the title, I, th I think, until after All-Star break. I think that we'll see flashes of greatness here and there, but I still think it's going to take some time because you got a lot of key guys missing time in the rotation. And again, I think it starts on defense with this team. This is a little bit older team, so this is going to be more of a defensive team defense than actually individual defense. So I think it's going to take some time to kind of find that rhythm. Let's touch on Russell Westbrook. Um, hasn't got off to a very good start. Uh, Sunday night, he looked a little bit more like himself, had 13 assists. But uh, thoughts on Russell and, and him kind of finding his way on this team? Well, you know, his rhythm is being able to do everything when he wants to. You know, get a grab of 20 rebounds, grab 20 assists, and score of 30 points. He used to doing that, but he on a team now where – he got to figure out the thing that he can – he does everything well, but one thing that he can dominate at because you got right. Carmelo, you got AD, you got um, Dwight. They're going to get all those rebounds. LeBron, they're going to get up most of the rebounds, so you're not going to get 10, 15 rebounds a night. Assist, I think you can do that. You're still going to have the ball a lot. You're still going to be a uh, quarterback in the offense and doing all those things. So that I think the assists and the points, 15 and 15, I think you can do that. I think the rebounds are going to drop because you have so many guys that rebound on that team now. So just tr just try to be a better defensive player. I think I think Russ can pick up his defense and lead on defense because he, he's been a great defensive player his career. But for the most part, he's just got one of those things that he's – that that, that – kept him averaging the triple-double is going to go away being on this team. And I think he got to find a way to be okay with that. Yeah, I think his whole thing is he, need, again, to piggyback what you said, kind of finding his spots, I think he doesn't want to step on people's toes. There's always been such a narrative about Russ as you can't do this, you can't do that without him. But I think he's finally starting to prove people wrong with that narrative. I think Russ can do whatever he sets his mind to. But I think he's in a position right now where he's coming to a team with AD, LeBron, uh, Carmelo and some, uh, so some other good pieces. So I think he just needs to kind of find his, his, his pick and choose his spaces, uh, spaces. And I feel like the first handful of games, he didn't want to step on nobody's toes, but Russ has to be Russ, um, you know, for the Lakers to get what they need out of him. So again, to me, it's just timing, it's chemistry. I don't think it'll take too long because Russ is a good, smart player. But again, once this team is on all cylinders, are going to be scary. Their next five games to try to find some kind of rhythm and footing. They're at San Antonio, at OKC, home versus Cleveland, uh, and two versus Houston. So those are all people that they should win, uh, should beat. So we'll see if they can find that chemistry. But again, like you said, I mean, it's just going to take some time, definitely on the defensive end. James Worthy says some. Uh, at the end of last week about he wanted to see AD more in the paint and more dominant. What are your thoughts on, you know, AD is as talented as they come. You mostly find them on the perimeter. But last game he actually did get in the post a little bit more and he was unstoppable. Uh, thoughts on him kind of mixing more of the inside-out game uh, to be more dominant? I think I think uh, James Worthy is right. To me, um, I think he needs to be in the paint majority of the time, like all the time. You have a different team now. You are you have to you, you can beat Tim Duncan now. You can catch the ball on the block, take your time, post up every play, and if they double anything, you have people to kick it out right. to all over the court. Yeah, so right. I think I think now more than ever he needs to be watching Tim Duncan film. You know what I'm saying? Embracing the double teams and just being dominant. And uh, James Worthy know what he's talking about. If anybody talking about that AD needs right. to be in the paint, you know James Worthy is right. Yeah. 
No, I definitely agree. I think just today's game pushes all of the skilled bigs to the perimeter, and they take a lot of time out there. Not, not that he's not effective, but there's no one in the game that could stop him down on that block. So, you know, with Dwight and, and, and DeAndre Jordan not really being go-to guys down on the block, AD can definitely be that guy for them. Continuing on with the look ahead, we have the Hawks versus Sixers playoff rematch. Ben Simmons has stepped away from the game a little bit to get his mental clear. Can that bridge be repaired even if he clears his mental over there in Philly? I mean, I mean, I'm the person to ask. Trust me, I know about players stepping away to get their mental clear. <laughs> Ron did it to us right <laughs> in training camp, so I know how they go. But with Ben, I don't know if it can be repaired. You know, you got guys that that like AI and other guys saying that all he got to do is come in and play, and 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 do his job, and the fans accept him back and love him. But I don't, I don't think that because I think he's mentally checked out. You know what I mean? He's not just mental. He's just not physically not physically not there. I think he's mentally not there either. Right. You know what I mean? And and that's why it's cool for him to be away from the team because his mind is somewhere else. Uh, I don't I don't think it'd be fixed, man. I think he, I think he has to make they have to make a move. They they talking to Kyrie, uh, Ben Simmons move, you know all type of stuff like that. But he has to go, man. I don't think that that relationship can be repaired, especially after the things. Um, Obed and Bede has said, you know, he tried to fix him up with saying he's still his brother, but at the end of the day, he heard what you said the first time, and and he go, he won't <laughs> right. he won't be able to erase that. Right. My yeah, I I don't. We're paid to not give a fuck what the fans think, you know. So who cares what the fans say? Boo! This is not on your home court. It's the internal things that to me makes me seem like this is an unfixable situation. Uh, you know, we've obviously everyone's touched on it. You know, what Doc said at the end of that that series, uh, what Embiid just says a few times, and again he tried to, you know cover it up or fix it or, or, or mend it when uh, he, he took the mic the other day and, and said that he's still their brother. But, again, when you're not wanted by the, by, by the people in the locker room, that's when it is unrepairable. So, you know, to me it's on Daryl Morey and Elton Brand to move him, you know, because they're definitely going to get something for him. I think what's held this process up is they really thought that he would change his mind. But, obviously, he has checked out. And if, if a player's not mentally there – you're not going to get nothing out of him. It's really just going to continue to hold the team back. Because now every day the team is held hostage with Ben Simmons' questions instead of focusing on who the fuck they're supposed to be playing. So, you know, for Ben, man, take your time. You know, this mental – this shit, this shit is a lot. The game is different now. Players are different now. And, and mental health is real. So he stepped away from the game to clear his mind. Some people agree. Some people disagree. At the end of the day, it's his decision. But I definitely feel like the bridge is burned and they need to make a move. Before we go forward, though, you know they coerced him into saying Ben's still our brother because, one, they can't trade him if he's not playing. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? And, and, and two, they got they paying him while he's somewhere else chilling on vacation with, with the Jenner girl. So, I don't know, big, bro. Hey, big bread, too. Bread, <laughs> big bread. <laughs> big bread. You know, but, but with Simmons gone, obviously Embiid is your go-to. Tobias Harris is that, that second guy. Who is the third guy? You know, Seth Curry had a great – game the other day uh, I think 23 in the first quarter which Matt uh, only only his brother Steph had topped him at 25 for the most points in a quarter this year uh, Maxi is coming on strong you got green over there in your eyes who can be that third option if Ben Simmons is not available for the for foreseeable future uh it's gonna be hard to say but I think for the for the most part I think they you know they can go twin towers and try to Throw Drummond in there and let him be dominant and pick up a bigger role. I know Seth Curry is going to do what he do. Uh, he's getting off to a great start, and he can, he can be that guy. But for the most part, I think to help out this team, to get for a guy that can go in and dominate rebounding-wise and, uh, and dominate around the basket along with Embiid, I think Drummond could be that guy. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the Hawks, I like this team. Uh, you know, they obviously surprised the world last year by the run they made, and they really weren't healthy. Uh, particularly with their young guys, uh, you know, someone you and I are both high on, Cam Reddish, uh, Hunter, Bogdanovich, uh, Collins, Capella, you know, Trey is the, the, the head of that snake. I really like this young team and what, the, what they've built and the culture they're building around there. What is the buzz around Atlanta with this team? Man, they can't, they're, ready, they're ready for this season to kick off. Everybody's excited about this season. Like you said, Cam Reddish is healthy. Uh, no, we both know nothing. Nothing like coming into a season after you get your big contract. Collins got his money. Experience is the best teacher. This team, this team had a great season last year. They went through injury. They went through ups and downs. They went through loss in the playoffs. So this year, with Nate coming in, being secure on his job as well, I think they're gonna they're gonna really shock some people and uh, have a better season than last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the East is tough, but I, I definitely like what they built um, over there, Atlanta. Moving on, Halloween Sunday. Jazz versus the Bucks. Both teams are expected to have a big season. Obviously, the Bucks coming off a championship. 
Uh, the Jazz coming off a dis disappointing, disappointing second-round loss in the playoffs. In your eyes, can they defend the title? I think they can, but I don't think they will. They definitely have to defend it because they'll defend the champions. But I don't know, Matt, because not having guys like P.J. Tuck on that team is going to hurt. I think he, he, he was a big uh, asset to that team as far as being the dog, being the guy mm -hmm. that, that can go in there and just, and just make things dirty, muff things up on, their, on any star that comes in their arena. Now, it's going to have to be Middleton, and that's going to take away from his offense, and he's not used to doing that. He's just not – he's a good defender. He's a great competitive mm -hmm. two-way player, but he's not P.J. Tuck on the defensive end. Right. I think that's going to hurt them at the end, and I think – I also think not having P.J. Tucker, um, not only just in the regular season, but when, it come, when the games count, Matt, that's what I'm really talking about. You know what I'm saying? The playoff mm -hmm. games. They didn't have – they don't have P.J. Tucker against KD in the playoffs. They don't win that series. So, mm -hmm. not having him is going to be – it's going to be a, a higher – a harder to, a task for them to come back and try to repeat as champions. No, I completely agree with the, with uh, P.J. Tucker. And, and for the casual fan, you, you know, everyone looks at stats. But there's so much more to the game than actual stats and, you know, how you can be effective on the court and, and change the dynamic of the game without necessarily scoring a lot of points. And, and, and P.J. Tucker was definitely one of those guys. Um, looking to Utah. I mean, this team has, you know, a great coach in Quinn Snyder. They're the number one team in the West last year, uh, riddled by injury towards the end of the season. Mike Conley's back and healthy. I uh, talked to him the other day. He's in his 15th year. Donovan Mitchell looks as good as ever, uh, you know, defending defense player of the year, Rudy Gobert. Is, is this the year this team can make the jump and, and, and represent the West? No. <laughs> I, 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 I just don't think so. I mean, they, they have a great team. They have a great regular season team. But I know, I just know, Matt, you know, Donovan Mitchell is a beast. You know what I mean? But, and I love Quinn Snyder. But you, you have guys that can make shots in the regular season, and they just can't make them when it comes down to the, the semifinals or the finals or the Western Conference finals. You know, it's just, it's just different games. You know, I, and, and I don't see them having that guy. You know, I, I, they, need that, they need a third guy to me. They need another mm -hmm. star that can come in and take a little pressure off of Donovan Mitchell. I, I, I like all the other guys. I like Bondanovich. He can shoot the ball. He makes big shots. But at the end of the day, his game is still limited. This is a good team. Like I said, a great regular season team, Matt. But I just don't see them being there when we're watching teams playing for the trophy. Mm. I love also Jordan Clarkson, too, the reigning sixth man. I'm a big fan of Jordan Clarkson, but that's someone who's coming off the bench. And I said this last year and when I was on ESPN, and I got so much fucking hate. <laughs> on social media from it but like you said I think they need that consistent and is Mike Conley kind of past that point of his career where they have that consistent second 20 point a game score that's what you need every team if you look at every team that made a real run they had at least two guys that were going to give you 20 every night and I don't really feel like this team has that again Jordan Clarkson is capable of it but he's coming off the bench who is going to be that starter that when Donovan Mitchell rests or Donovan Mitchell's not really going, can carry the load. And I still don't think they have that. Again, Mike Conley in, in the past has been that in his career, but he's in his 15th year, been troubled by injury the past few years. I don't know if that's still, you know, in his repertoire. So we'll have to see. Uh, great showdown, Halloween night. Make sure you enjoy that after you're done, before or after you're done trick or treating. Jack, are you tricking mm. or treating this uh, Halloween? You've been known uh, to neither. trick. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> hey, but I'm... I'm I'm treating this one. <laughs> <laughs> Next up on the radar, presented to you by DraftKings. Big matchup Friday night, Luka versus the Joker, Mavs versus Nuggets. Last year's MVP, the Joker, they have him on as 15-1 to 1 odds to win it this year. And again, favorite to win MVP, they have Luka at 4-1. to 1. Before we talk about these teams, Jack, uh, if you were to pick one of those two guys to win MVP, who would it be? Kevin Durant. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying these odds. They must be it, doing it. They must be doing these odds, Matt. With 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 just uh, they just the assuming what? that KD gonna play half the season or something. You know what I'm saying? What if he played the full season? What if Braun played the full season? We got other guys that we considering a uh, Greek freak. We got other guys that we consider the best in the game right now. So I don't. I, I don't like these odds at all. But just for the sake of the conversation, I I'm gonna pick Luca. Luca's a mm. stashy stuffer. He's one of the best players in the game. He does it all. He's exciting to watch. And he's going to get this team to the playoffs. So I say Luka. Mm, I'm not mad at that. Yeah, if I were to pick out of the two, and really Joker was the first big to win it in a minute, I want to say since Shaq won it. This is really a guard-driven league now. So obviously hats off to Joker for being able to grab that last year. But, yeah, if I had to pick out of those two, I would definitely pick Luka. But, again, if I had to pick in the league, I'm picking KD. Uh, I think he's on a mission this year. Their team has started off a little slow. 
but I definitely think they'll find their footing. Hopefully they figure out the Kyrie situation. We'll talk about all that later. These two teams, um, did Dallas do enough in the offseason to get better? Uh, when is Jamal Murray expected back? Because I think if Jamal Murray rejoins his team, it can be anything that he was in the past. This uh, Denver Nugget team is going to be scary. Yeah, and also I think Tim Duncan went after Shaq. But uh, I think, man, they, they, they need their star, Matt. They need their star. He got to get back on the court bad. They need Murray bad. Um, just, just from what he did in the bubble, bro, I think everybody's anticipating him coming back and, and, and seeing if, if he can do that for a full season. You know what I'm saying? They own arena, you know, just 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 in the full NBA season. But for the most part, they can get him back. They're gonna be a t- they're gonna be a problem, man, because Jokic is unstoppable. I just need Murray back to, to with the dynamic of him and Jokic together and everybody else to fall in line. Yeah. And then too, you know, another kid that got his rookie max extension, um, Michael Porter Jr., someone we both like. Um, he's definitely gonna have to step his game up as far as consistency. He shows flashes of greatness to me. I've always been a big fan of this kid. So I'm excited to see. You know, that to me, that's their three-headed monster. Then you also add Aaron Gordon in the mix and uh, the other pieces they have, Jeff Green, so on and so forth. So this uh, Denver team is going to be uh, interesting. As far as the Mavs go, I mean, Luke is a monster, but I don't really know if uh, Porzingis is ready to really be his Robin or not. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, definitely should be a good matchup Friday night. Make sure you guys check that shit out. Next up, my new favorite segment, Secure the Bag, presented to you by Moneyline. Chicago Bulls are off to a 3-0 start. Uh, They made some key free agent acquisitions this year. Uh, Jack picking up Lonzo Ball, DeMar DeRozan, Alex Caruso. Ball is averaging 14 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists right now. DeRozan's at 21 points, 6 rebounds, 4 assists. I love what they're doing over there. They play with a lot of energy. Let's talk about that team real quick. What are your thoughts on the Bulls? I like them, especially in the East. I like the Mm -hmm. energy they bring. It's a new look for all these guys. Um, I think all of them are playing free in this new environment. And a lot of times we know how, how a new environment helps basketball players. Mm-hmm. I, I've been one of those guys. So it's a good look for them, Matt. And it, it, it's, it's, it's surprising, but it's a good look to see what they be able to do in the East. Yeah, I love Alex Caruso. I think he's one of probably the biggest spark plug in the game right now. I know the Lakers are definitely going to miss him this year to go along with Zach Levine and uh, Vucevic. Let's touch on... Was this a smart investment or not? Lonzo Ball signs a four-year, $80 million deal. Obviously, he secured the bag. Good investment or questionable investment? Great investment. Great yes, investment. Sir. You got, you got, you yes, got to spend that money somewhere. You spend it on a solid point guard that, 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 that has a high basketball IQ that's only going to get better, that's starting to come into its own. Uh, with the, he, he had a lot of pressure on him coming to the league, and I think all that's falling off him now. I think Chicago, he's going to be great. Um, definitely, definitely deserve that contract. Money well spent. Yes, great investment to me. I think we're going to finally see the Lonzo Ball we all knew he was capable of being. Obviously, the Lakers, we know what happened there. Uh, New Orleans didn't really get along too much in, the, in, in that system, um, although Zion Williams really did not want him to go. Now in Chicago, again, this team plays fun, free, fast. That's his style of play. He's running the show. Uh, so definitely great investment. Next up, our man DeMar DeRozan keeps getting the bag. He signed a three-year, $82 million deal. I already know what your answer is going to be on this, but I have to ask it. Great investment or questionable investment? Great investment, man. Definitely great investment. Um, if you can get a guy like DeMar DeRozan, a uh, mid-range killer, guaranteed to get you 21 to 25 points a game, uh, going to compete, and a big shot maker. Um, you know, I, I, I like it. I like it all the way around. Yeah. Agreed. Another great investment. Uh, a veteran presence who's, who, who's been through the battles can help this younger team with some guidance and veteran leadership along with his play. Um, to me, I think that the Bulls are a top three, at worst top four um, in the Eastern Conference. So I'm excited to see um, if they can stay healthy, what this team can do. Make sure you check out our brother, Deion Taylor, one of the hottest new black directors in Hollywood. His episode is dropping this Thursday. October 28th. Enjoy the teaser. Who are your film influences? Spike Lee, John Singleton, etc. Any specific films or song or artists who inspired you the most? Um, John, you know, I knew John very well. Rest in peace, John. Man. Rest in peace. Yeah. Incredible, man. I only got to know him for a short time. I met John in a very weird way. I met John at an event and uh, I had ended up talking to him about a couple films that I was trying to put together at the time and Free Agents was one of those films. Mm. And um, I had just finished doing a movie called Supremacy. I remember you showed me that. Mahershala Ali mm-hmm. and, and Danny Glover. And 
I was getting washed with that film, man. Like we had made this incredible movie and we could not find the distribution for it, home for it. I'm like, man, what is going on? He pulled me to the side and was like, man, this is just what the business is for you as a black filmmaker. Mm. A couple months later, I was like, I don't want to do no more serious films. I went and did this movie, Meet the Blacks. And John was the first person to call me opening night and Meet the Blacks and sent me a picture of the ticket. And he was like, nigga, this the funniest shit I done seen. <laughs> and I remember just being like, damn, this is crazy. Got on the phone with him and, you know, and kept in touch with him. But he was always a great person in terms of like, not always, but over the course of time, he would always pop up at the right time to say something great. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, But John's a huge influence because I love what he was about. Uh, but I really, really love the branding of Tyler Perry, obviously, you know, doing it his mm -hmm. own way, building his own thing. But I'm a giant Steven Spielberg fan, man. I think Spielberg is incredible just for the simple fact of what I told you earlier. Like, I love the fact that, you know, although he's not a black man, I love that he jumped genres and did it the right way. So you think of Color Purple, mm -hmm. think of E.T., you know what I mean? Like, these are completely different films and Jaws, right. you know, and I just love that, man. I've always been like, man, I want to be ever to be that prolific as a black filmmaker in the space. We have a very special guest for you guys today. El Jefe, mm -hmm. Steven Espinoza, president of Showtime Sports. Steve, man, thank you in your busy schedule for making time to talk to me and Jack today. Are you kidding? I just, I just want to make real clear from the outset, this was not a requirement. <laughs> and this will not forced upon you. There's legitimate. I'm a legitimate guest here. All right. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, but ja hey, Jack. But Jack, when you know when you got El Presidente on your show, that means your show is doing well and it's not going nowhere. Just, just having them on our show, I could exhale a little bit. We got a little sense of security. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Hey, well, let's get to it. Uh, Steve, you came on set one day when we <laughs> when we had ad reads and we were trying to do the Homeland ad reads. What were your thoughts after hearing me fuck up 18 times and Jack have to catch himself a few times? Where did you think the future of this show was going, if there was a future for it? <laughs> uh, look, it, it, it didn't change my idea of the future of the show. I just, look, everybody has their strengths. You know, not everybody's good at everything. So, you know, it's sort of like, you know, all, all that big team around you, they're excellent at bringing out, you putting your position to succeed. That just wasn't a position in which you were succeeding at the right. time. Right. Hey, I don't. I still don't. <laughs> hey, I still don't think I know how to say it. Was it Manny? How you Mandy say it? Last Patinkin. Mandy Patinkin. Yeah. See, I, I I couldn't get it. It took me like eight, nine shots, and, I, and, 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 and the boss is sitting right there. I'm like, fuck. We might not have a job when we get done. God damn it. <laughs> but oh, uh, uh, but on but on a real note, you know, tell me your thoughts. Obviously, Showtime basketball being fairly new before we jumped on board. Um, you know, you guys struck gold, we struck gold. What have been your thoughts over the last two years of the growth of the show heading into season three? I mean, being completely candid, um, you know, we had high hopes for the show, but this has exceeded everything we really could have wished for. Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm on with you guys. Um, I've said it many times. I mean, you guys are one of the top sports podcasts. You, you got there within the first year. And you know you've arrived, because I, I hear this all the time. Um, I'm not sure if people say it to you, but I get pitches all the time from people saying, well, it's the, it's the all the smoke of blah, blah, <laughs> right, blah. Right, you right, know, right. We, we wanna be the all the smoke of the NFL. You know, right. and when you start setting the stage, when you start you know, setting the curve for everybody else, you know you've made an impact in a very, very crowded field, because as you guys know, you know, that's the biggest challenge in podcasting is how do you, you stand out and you guys have, have hit it out of the park in that respect. Yeah, definitely appreciate that. Right. Appreciate um, that. Coming November 4th, the best of all the smoke returns to the actual Showtime linear. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You know, we always envisioned this that in success, it, it would incubate other projects, you know, and, and doing a best of on the channel is, is sort of is an easy one. And even, you know, regular fans of this show who have seen these, you know, I hear really good feedback because we're packaging them up a little bit, you know, differently, you know, 15 episodes every Thursday, starting November 4th, you know, paired with Jesus and Marrow. And, you know, this is a, an opportunity to sort of, you know, put a slightly different format, revisit some of the best of, of, of y'all stuff. And we're happy to do it. it. It belongs on the network. 
One thing that I, I really love over here, and, and obviously shout out Brian Daly, who's uh, listening to this right now. I just love the creativity. I, I think, you know, like you said, Stephen, we're able to package stuff up a little different. You know what I mean? We're not just giving you the same raw cut of something else, but we're able to package it up, slice it up and different. And then and the one thing I appreciate is we've I mean, to me, we're more than a podcast. And I think we've continued to prove that. But you guys have, have allowed us to be creative within this space because like you said there's hundreds of thousands if not millions of podcasts out there and i think what obviously jack and i's dynamic is special but you guys allow us to be creative within this space and to me that's what continues to allow us to raise the bar and now people are trying to emulate what we're doing yeah you're right calling it a podcast is is sort of underselling it um what you guys have done either with iris and classic or starting to highlight hbcus um, you know, that's, that's not just sitting down in front of the microphone and going stream of consciousness. Um, you guys are creative types. And again, exceeded our expectations. Um, you know, Brian Daly was, when he brought it to me, he was, he was sort of your, your biggest advocate. And we had high hopes. Um, but again, you guys have, have exceeded that, not just in, in what you've achieved, but in the creative, what you're bringing to the table outside of the podcast. Right. KG Doc um, premieres Friday, November 12th. What was your first impression of KG when you met him? And when can, what can people expect from this doc as well? Two questions. Well, it's funny. You, you guys know, know KG, so feel free to disagree. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys who on the field and off the field or on the court and off the court are different guys. You know, some guys transform. You step, you step onto the court, you transform into your alter ego. Um, you know, Dame Lillard, you know, He's a, he's a beast on the court. He's pretty quiet off the court. Um, KG, I was surprised to find out when we first met him, um, he's, he's that guy 24 hours a day. <laughs> I, I, I feel like KG rolls out of bed just hype to be up in the morning, talking loud, in your face, you know, intensity. And, you know, it just, it's, it's great energy. I met him, strangely enough, when we were on an NBA trip, it was a preseason uh, trip. The Nets were touring China, and we were all on a flight from from JFK to uh, it was either Shanghai or, or Beijing. I got introduced on that flight, and we just started talking boxing. Pretty soon, they had to separate us because we were making too much noise and keeping the rest of the plane apart. <laughs> and that, that's when uh, you know that's when at that point, you know, we started talking about it, the dock. And now probably five, six years later, we started wow. talking about seriously. And, you know, at this point you see, it's a good reminder, you know, KG, it's been so long since KG came into the league, people have forgotten what a trailblazer he was, whether it's mm-hmm. financially, whether it's, you know, setting the stage for more players to come from high school, the kinds of things that he did. I mean, AI gets a lot of credit, rightfully so, but KG was the same kind of trailblazer. Right, agreed. Shout out to our guy Eric Newman. I've uh, been working diligently for a long time on this on this uh, KG doc. We know it's dropping. Jack, Jack's follow up question was: What what can we what what can our fans and what can we and what could our fans expect from this doc? It's the personal side. I mean, there's there's one thing you know we probably could have done a eight part doc with KG uh, because <laughs> aside from his energy, you guys know he's he's got to be one of the best storytellers I've ever mm-hmm. encountered. Absolutely. I mean. The way he tells stories, you just sit there and before you know it, it's a 45 minute story and you're on the ground laughing and crying and mm. thinking. And that's that's what it is. I mean, it, it really is the toughest part of making that talk is figuring out what goes in and what doesn't go in because, you know, you've got three or four docs, you know, mm. in, in his life. Absolutely. 2022 is going to be a big, uh, you know, big time for Showtime Sports, Showtime Basketball in particular. Uh, we're welcoming... Paul Pierce to the family. KG's already in the mix. KG's got a podcast coming out. Can you speak to some projects that uh, our fans should be expecting in 2022? I'll go in a slightly different direction, but I'll bring it back to you. We have a a John McEnroe doc, um, you know, coming up. And that's one that really hasn't been uh, visited in any, you know, in a really heavy duty full way. And I, I sort of feel like McEnroe was the Matt Barnes or the Steven Jackson of, of tennis at that point, Mm -hmm. you know, he was, you know, he, he didn't care what you thought. He went out there, did things his way. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's been a while. Look, that's early eighties was his real heyday. 
And people think about tennis and it's, you know, the white outfits and having tea at Wimbledon and things like that. That's not John McEnroe. <laughs> you know, John McEnroe was, was, a, was a, a G. I mean, all you have to do is go to the, the garden and see what kind of hero, you know, McEnroe is still to this day mm-hmm. to realize how, how he sort of changed tennis and, and actually became a New York City icon. That's hard to do as a tennis player. Right. Agreed. We've got another one from, uh, from Kevin Durant, which is right up your guy's alley. Uh, he did one for us last year uh, on PG County and looking at you know, how that became a, a breeding ground for some great players. Uh, he's looking at, you know, he and his partner, Rich Kleiman, are looking at uh, New York City point guards mm. you know, in that history. Mm. And, and more interestingly, like asking the question why you know, we can all think of when you say New York City point guard, there's a particular type that you can think of. And, and why is that? You know, and there's there's a lot of reasons sort of about New York City and growing up and playing in the city and what kind of game you develop here. Mm-hmm. I like that, I like that. And then uh, K- KG podcast, is, 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 am I hearing that correctly as well? Same thing, you know, there's just so much good content. It's 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 a waste, you know. It might end up being the world's longest podcast. I don't know how to cut that down. <laughs> you know, it just might be a continuous stream of consciousness for hours and hours on end, uh, but it won't be boring, that's for sure. Speak right. to, obviously, I felt like it was unjust. Um, Paul Pierce was let go of ESPN, um, you know, for stuff they thought didn't fit on brand. Um I think he was a great pickup for our team and our family. Speak to uh, what we can see uh, or expect from Paul Pierce. I feel like the truth is, is a great nickname. Um, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, it, it applied to him on the court, but he fits in right in with you guys and a lot of our other talent, a lot of our other programming, where he's not afraid of the truth. Um, and where a lot of guys, when that happened, where that, that sort of thing happened and, and he left ESPN, a lot of guys would have shut down. Um, not Paul Pierce. He, you know, he addressed it, addressed it continuously, wasn't apologetic, you know, and he was just, you know, him, you know, mm-hmm. and we're happy to give him another opportunity because he's a unique voice. Absolutely. Yeah. And last but not least, the education of Matt Barnes. Absolutely. What's up with that, El Jefe? <laughs> look, like I said, look, this that was more than we bargained for. We didn't know we were going to get a, a, a TV star, a scripted series, got a got a role in there. Couldn't do it without Stack as well. <laughs> and I, I don't think there there's anything like it in, in television. I can't think of another one uh, that's like it because it's not uh, it's not really about sports. Um, it's about a guy who played sports, but a really a, a, a really interesting guy dealing with the transition from one part of his life to another and again it's it's all real like the stuff mm-hmm. you know it, it's one of those situations one of the things that I, I say sometimes about boxing is it's hard to do a, a good fictional movie about boxing because the stuff that happens in real life is way crazier than anything you can make up fictionally right mm-hmm. and that's I think that applies to Matt Barnes life like we, yes. we don't need to make stuff up. Let's just take the stuff <laughs> right. that is actually <laughs> happening, and that's an interesting series right yes. now. Yes. No, I'm excited, man, to be Thanks. starring and producing uh, in my own show on this platform, man. It's been a dream come true. So, again, we appreciate that. Jack is going to be obviously right right there alongside of me making his acting debut as well. So, man, we're excited to get to work to that uh, yes, sir. early next year. Moving on to boxing. How has the boxing landscape changed since you came into it, and what is it like present day? Well, look, it's it, it sort of, it's the same thing um, that is affecting society and, and other sports. And I, I'd say the biggest thing is social media um, and not just the existence of social media, how it's changed the dynamic. It has given athletes in general uh, an independence, an autonomy, an ability to sort of directly engage, build their fan base, get their story out and, and, and really even monetize it, you know, starting with you know, college now all the way through their career. So no longer is a fighter reliant on promoters and traditional media to be able to get his story out, to build a fan base, to speak his truth. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, now, it's gone already so far that, you know, now you have people who have built huge fan bases like a Jake Paul, who have now used that to leverage their way into the sport. I, I would never have predicted that. Um, look, I, I think it's, 
an interesting development. There's definitely a lot of interest out there in the business, but that would not have been possible without social media. Agreed. Let's talk about these Philly fighters. Two guys that I'm close friends with and guys I'm fans of, Jared Ennis and Stephen Coolboy of Fulton. What do you think about these guys and the fights they got coming up? Philly, Philly has a great history. You know, you talk about New York City point guards and, you know, there are certain guys that come to mind, whether it's Rod Strickland or Kenny Anderson or Mark Jackson. When you say Philly fighter, you think of a, a gritty, tough guy. Joe Frazier, Bernard Hopkins, like mm -hmm. uh, probably the two biggest names. Um, and in Jerron Ennis and Stephen Fulton, you have two of the guys who could very well be carrying the sport over the next few years. I mean, mm -hmm. for my money, I think Jerron Ennis is arguably, you know, the best fighter under age 25, you know, in mm -hmm. the sport. Um, and it's gotten really tough to get him fights, you know, because <laughs> he has not, he has not shown a weakness yet. You know, Stephen Fulton is a really exciting young fighter as well. He's in a big fight on November 27th, unifying the title against Brandon Figueroa. Um, you know, and you talk to these two guys, you know, Stephen's a, you know, a, a big personality. Jerron's a little bit more reserved. But once they're in the ring, you see the dog in them. The dog comes mm -hmm. out. And that's where you see that Philly fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, November 6th. Shout out to Isaiah and Carter Barnes. They will be 13 that day. But also another important thing on that day is Canelo steps back in the ring versus Plant. Uh, what intrigues you most about this matchup? The consensus, pound for pound, number one fighter in the sport. You know, pretty clearly the biggest draw in the sport. It, it's it's the opportunity to see you know LeBron, Steph Curry of boxing. Um, mm -hmm. But this particular fight, um, the first time we've got an undisputed 168 pound champion, at least potentially never been anybody in that division um, that has done that before had all four belts and it's only been happened across any division six times at all so you know people complain too many champions well look whoever wins that fight you know they are the champion they've got all the belts mm. in that division and that's a, a big thing for Canelo even with everything he's accomplished and it's even a, a, a bigger thing for, for Plant to be on the world stage but the interesting thing about Plant is we, we don't know how good he is. You know, he is undefeated, uh, but he has not faced anyone of the caliber of Canelo. So I don't think anybody can really tell you what's going to happen. You know, Canelo has obviously only got the one loss to Floyd Mayweather. He's been dominant elsewhere. Uh, but here we go. We have a little bit of an unknown quantity. You know, their only way to tell how good a guy is, you put him in with an elite fighter and see what happens. Yes, sir. Well, Steve, thank you. And um, I think Jack will see you at the fight in a couple Absolutely. weeks. Absolutely. We'll see yes, you. Yes, sir. I will be Give there. the boys my best, Matt. Tell them right. happy birthday. Appreciate it. Next up, one of our other favorite segments. I just like talking about the bag. I love when these guys are getting their money. I need some of it. Pass some of that shit over here. Uh, we got fan questions. Jack, go ahead and start it off. Fan questions. Ed Young King KP. Who do you think was the biggest snub in the top 75 ooh. list of all time? Ooh, 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 ooh. I mean, there's, there's been much debate about this. Uh, to me, the top guys uh, in the conversation should be Dwight Howard, uh, Tracy McGrady, and Clay Thompson. If I'm forgetting anyone, forgive me. To me, all three of those guys should have been in there. I think Dwight, because we're in such a what have you done for me lately, that everyone forgets how dominant this dude was for the first nine, ten years of his career until he, you know, until he had that bad back injury and rushed back with the Lakers. Uh, to me, he was one of the scariest dominant big men we've seen. Uh, Tracy McGrady, uh, an instant bucket, uh, riddled by injury throughout his career, but tremendous score when he was on the court. And then what the fuck can you say about Klay Thompson? This dude's a winner, uh, does his job to a T, one of the greatest shooters we've ever seen. You know, when I was looking at that list, Jack, and obviously to, to be on that list is a tremendous thing, but I was reading about some of the older players, and you never really want to knock none of the older players, but some of those dudes couldn't play in today's game, period, or couldn't even play back when we played. It, it, it just their game wouldn't translate. So, you you know, you, when you see guys like Dwight and T-Mac and, and, and Clay miss the cut because they put some of these older guys in there, although they were, you know, beneficial for back in the day, if we're just talking about the 75 straight ballers that that's supposed to represent this league, some of those old heads shouldn't have been on there, in my opinion. Well, I, I agree with you, Matt. And you have everybody around the basketball world calling this guy 
the most skilled, complete player of all time as a point guard. And how is he not on there? And I guess people just, you know, they love you one minute, they hate you, they love you again. But how is Kyrie not, Irving not on this list? Oh, yeah. Shit, I forgot Kyrie, Kyrie too. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Like, like, like these, these people are, are stuck in the – they're just stuck in, in the now and just, just on some BS. But it's no – that's why I say I don't – I don't really pay attention, Matt, because me personally, it's about 30 motherfuckers on that list that I would have bust their ass. You know what I'm saying? So so I don't hey, really pay attention this, to that though, shit. Not to cut you off. Let me ask you this. Do you think that Kyrie was snubbed due to nothing on the court, but maybe some of the off-the-court stuff, in your personal opinion? No question. Because if you're talking about basketball, how could he not be? Right. I agree. I definitely – I forgot Kyrie, but, he, I mean, skill-wise – People not fucking with him. So, again, <laughs> these lists are crazy. I always see, and I hate to see it because, I mean, obviously I work for ESPN, so I appreciate that check. But the list they be coming up with, like, I just laugh at those lists sometimes. Like, who's picking these fucking lists? Obviously, it's people who haven't played. To me, I, I want to know the qualifications for the people who are picking these, these Bags. lists. I, I don't, yeah, the, the 75 list is, is whatever. But you always see, like I said, the ESPN list is always ranking people and had Kobe like at the backside of 10 one time. And it's just, to me, like they need certain people with certain qualifications to make these kind of lists because sometimes I think people who've never touched the game and although you could be a reporter, I think there's got to be more players picking these lists because we were the ones out there grinding, fighting, and have a different appreciation and respect for these guys night in, night out. So those lists are hard to make, obviously, and, and it's been such a talented league. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of snubs every time you make a list, but, you know, obviously those are four notables that – should have definitely been on the list. Yep. Next up, Leopardron Chris. Who is a player who's under the radar that can be a star? Good question. Ah, uh, the player that's under the radar that could be a star. That's a good question. Hmm. I'll, I'll let you answer that one first, man. I got to think. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Actually, now, shout out to Sacramento Kings since they're paying me. I got a new job over there <laughs> doing pregame and postgame. Uh, but as far as players I like, they